Hello, I am here with Radha Ramaswamy Basu, who is the founder and CEO of iMerit. She is the leading tech entrepreneur and a pioneer in the Indian software business. Radha, how are you today? I'm great. Nice to talk to you, Lindsay. Great. Um, and I'm Lindsay Aziz. I'm the program coordinator for AI for Good. So we're just going to go ahead and get started on these questions. So for starters, you are an extremely successful businesswoman that has had inclusion at your core throughout the entirety of your career. What has fostered this commitment to using your success for good? So I've been an, you know, been an engineer, I've been in the tech business for a very long time. And one of the things I've really found is that in the tech business, inclusion is really good for business. And inclusion, and by that I mean having a really inclusive um, workforce, set of employees, bringing the best talent into solving client problems, into using of technology, and making sure that technology does not create a divide. You know, we talked today about digital divide. I never want to have in the future a discussion about AI divide. I want that inclusion to be built in and designed in into everything we do from a technology viewpoint. So I think that, and if that was something we did and we said it was something separate, you have to create a nonprofit to do that. I don't believe in that. I believe that there are two, actually, I believe in two feet planted firmly on the ground. One is the business success, the client success, what we say is being maniacally focused on clients. And on the other one, building an inclusive workforce and bringing those two things together through technology, to me really is about creating successful businesses. And so this has been at the core of my thinking in my very long career, and I don't think you want me to date myself, but you know, I've been in the industry for 45 years. And if you go back to some of the things right from the beginning to the start of um, IT in India, I was there right in the beginning, and we can talk more about this. And that inclusion has created multi-billion dollar businesses and the entire, um, the entire, like, the creation of the middle class, the burgeoning middle class in India. And that to me proved that this can be very successful in business. And that is at the core of how I think about it. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And it sounds like it's worked out very well throughout your career. And I'm just curious, have you ever like had to struggle between those two things, between your career and the most altruistic path or what you feel like is the best way to move forward in terms of inclusion? Actually not. And I, and I think, I know people would say, really? But actually not, Lindsay. And there, there's something about, um, I think, thinking that way from a design point of view and believing in the power of uh, particularly young people and the power of you know women and believing that... Um, this is a change that and a movement that can actually change the way business flourishes. And maybe because of that kind of almost passionate belief, no, I've never had to choose. I've been in large corporate for 20 years. Um, I started a software company, took it public on NASDAQ. I've been a professor and created a frugal innovation lab, a hub. I've started iMerit and it's a very successful technology AI data solutions company. And uh, at the core of all of this has been this inclusion and inclusive workforce in being able to do away with technology being a divider, but technology being an, an includer, or if that's the word. No, I have not had to choose between the two. I don't know, is that? Thing. Yeah, that's wonderful. Or is that I just think, naive? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think with everything that you've accomplished that you can say it's naive. I think it's just wonderful. So that, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. So moving on, uh, one of the most pressing issues that you see and seek to solve with iMerit 
is youth and women's unemployment, especially in India. So I want to talk a little bit about your experience with that and how iMerit seeks to help with that, as well as what do you think the root causes of these issues are? So um, first of all, let me say that the iMerit inclusive uh, approach, um, remember I talked about those two feet, this, I truly believe that business drives inclusion because without that successful maniacal focus on client success, client health, solving client problems, we could not grow this company because then you're doing it like, you know, because people feel, they feel they want to do good for you. I don't want anybody giving me anything because they feel sorry for us or because we are, um, you know, they want to do good. I want this to really be at the core of our client success. So what are some of the root causes of non-inclusion of youth and young women? First of all, when somebody asks me the question, oh my gosh, and I've had a lot of people, including some leaders in the, in, in, even in, with our clients or in the technology world or VCs say, wow, how is it possible that you have 52% women in a tech business? And I say very simply, you know, have you actually seen the world? It's kind of 50-50. <laughs> it's kind of 50-50, right? They say, oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. And I say, why is it tech and venture capital and venture capital in tech? Why can't it be 50-50? That, that's the question we should be asking. Mm -hmm. So that is one I think is a root cause in just being able to change the way we think about it and the questions we ask. The second thing is we have to believe that technology is about having diversity. It's about having, uh, I don't mean just having a chief diversity officer. I love those people, but it's not. It has to be in, ingrained in the in the whole way we design things, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about having diversity, it's about having inclusion, it's about having, um, uh, making sure that bias is not set in. And that's so true for AI, right? And if you don't think about the power that young people and young women and women bring into, and people from different backgrounds, and they could be somebody from a rural background, it could be somebody from, um, you know, having a minority or tribal or, and this is not just in India, uh, one of our real, um, the uh, one thing that we do very strongly in the United States is about creating jobs and in an inclusive way. Our deliveries, uh, one of our delivery centers is in New Orleans mm -hmm. and it's about young people in New Orleans. And is it that they cannot participate in the AI and digital economy? Or is it that we haven't actually brought out the best in them? So the skilling and being able to upskill people leapfrog into the AI and digital economy is about believing that they can do it and providing that little change to be able to do that. Oftentimes I get the, the, the comment from our employees that says, I, I asked the question, this was just a week ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I knew you seven years ago and you just came out of high school and you didn't know what it meant to work in a job and, and be able to deliver. And here you are leading um, in autonomous vehicles, the leading multi-center fusion uh, label ops for a top client, the, one of the largest clients in the industry and you're leading a team of 250, actually that person was leading a team of 400 people. I said, how did you get there? And you know, he kind of smiled and he said to me, this was a young man, he said, um, because you believed in me. Wow. And that is at the core, you believe that this is possible, believe in the power of youth, believe in the power of young women and believe that it's possible and then skill the heck out of them to make it possible put in the technologies use ai ml to skill them put in the technologies and the processes you know that's what ai is about right now if you want to get ai into deployment what's the question what are the processes uh, 
the, the principles, the, um, the policies, the governance, and the, the, the sort of the, almost the data engine to be able to deliver the pipeline, to be able to deliver the highest quality AI data. If you skill people into that, that will happen. So I think the root causes are about um, believing, um, believing in the, that inclusion really provides the best uh, examples and the answers uh, to believe in, in the, the power of the people, the, the sort of the can-do attitude, uh, skilling them, and then really going out and saying, hey, we can do it and being able to do it. That's amazing. Yeah, I think you have such like a refreshing perspective and just like your ability to see the potential in everyone, I think is really inspiring. One of the things I want to talk a little bit more about is kind of how you equip these people to be empowered to move up in their career. And that's something that Imer does a lot. And so that was something I found really interesting. So I found that Imer offers a range of supports for its employees including learning and development programs, and in addition, living necessities such as healthcare. So why did IMER find it imperative to include these in its goal of inclusion? So first of all, IMER's um, goal is twofold, goals are twofold. One is being offering the best solutions to our client problems. And the second one is providing opportunities to a very broad set of young people. I keep saying young people because inclusion is more than just young people. It's just at the average age of our employee base and you can smile, it's 24.1. Huh. And That's it's really. a young employee base and so full of, and what I love about it is they don't know what they don't know. There's no baggage. So whatever you're skilling them into, you know, whether it's autonomous, mobility, um, autonomous vehicles, AI in med, natural language processing, they think that is the world. And I love it because that is where the world's going. That's where technology is going. They believe technology is at the core of everything we do, AI and agriculture. So um, it's offer, offering the opportunities. I mean, just think about it in the last year, in the COVID year, our company created 1,200 jobs. Wow. That is a lot in COVID year. That's because our clients believed in us. As they grew, we grew. They came back with more for us, doing more for them. In some cases, I have a mantra that says, do more with less. And that might sound like we're taking jobs away. No, you're doing more because you can help to automate some of the things we were doing yesterday, which means we can offer more for our clients. So mm -hmm. our business grew, our opportunities grew, and thereby we created more opportunities for the people. Now, you asked the question, the learning and development and the, how did we support the employees during COVID? So let me give you an example. So we had COVID insurance for all of our people. Investing in people means all facets of the people, of our employees. Not just jobs and income, but skills. And skills is very important because as, as our clients really grow and go up this value chain in skills, we have to be very fast behind them. In some cases, even a little bit ahead of them if you wanna be proactive. How do you do that without continuous upskilling for our people? We have a, a learning academy, which has things like communication, comprehension, and culture, and confidence in the way our, our employees deal with clients. Sometimes an employee is a very fairly young employee is on Slack with the CTO of our client, and that confidence in being able to, com to communicate. We are in computer vision. You know, last year we might have been just experts in 3D LiDAR. Now it's all about multi sensor fusion. It's about learning about medical applications of AI in med. It's about learning about natural language processing in financial technologies. So, how can we do this if we can't continuously upskill our people? 
And that is truly a continuous process. Now I, I will come to work culture. Before the work culture, the, the what should I say, the, that spirit of work was in our centers. People would come in and I tell you, Lindsay, if you walked into one of our centers, you would feel so buoyant about the culture in the workplace and how people communicated and the confidence that was built. And clients would come in and sometimes we would say jokingly, Clients walk in, then you know they're sold or potential clients. You just have to walk into one of our centers. Now that all became work from home a year ago, mm -hmm. right? A little over a year ago, we went from hundred percent, ninety eight percent work from centers of different kinds. Could be a technology center, could be a delivery center, could be our solutions architects, etc. And we went to went to almost all work from home, whether it was in India, in the US, in Bhutan, it didn't matter, we have a center in Bhutan. So now that work culture has to become a virtual work culture. We were hiring, mm -hmm. we hired 1200 people who had never seen an office of iMerit. And so these are the kinds of things that really started to happen and we needed to bring that into uh, the work culture. We had, we have centers of excellence that we had for AI data. We had centers of excellence. We have one center that is globally acknowledged of a center of excellence for AI computer vision data. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to know, I mean, you, you would appreciate this. It was virtually an all women's center. Mm -hmm. wow. They were the center of excellence. So how do you create that work culture virtually? Um, and how do you make sure that people have the feeling of empowerment and an inclusion and a path to development in this very remote way? And bringing on 1,200 people who've not seen, seen a center, right? And we haven't seen, I used to know, like I've met every person in the centers and I feel myself a little bit of distance, not being, having met all the people just for myself sure. and I'm the CEO of the company. The other thing that support is important is COVID example. We had a crisis hotline. Over 900 people called in. 900 people called in. And we know that it was especially in this last three, four months that India went through a horrible crisis. But it was even in the U.S. People mm -hmm. became the single wage earner in the family. And they were nervous. So will the jobs continue? Will the... And I had somebody tell me, I get nervous if I don't have volumes to work on of data coming in. In a day for me, I wonder, am I not doing well? Am I not going to have a job? Because they were the single wage earner. Yeah. COVID insurance uh, is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Is, um, you know, a lot of young people stay in, in a, it's called a joint family in India. I found that a lot of young people are getting to work with their, going home and living with their families here in the US. And the joint family in India, what is the point in giving COVID insurance just to our employees where we extended it to their parents and their grandparents actually, because they all live together. Otherwise, they're not gonna go get tested because they're not as well off. And, they, and so we provided that. So it is about building a tech propelled advanced employee-based experts in the loop for the future. And that includes all of these developing of people, investing in them, um, you know, three years of development of people, continuous skilling, the support, the COVID insurance, because our clients need experts in the loop of AI technology. And that's who we are. So long, winded answer, but I wanted you to see the different facets of how we develop this experts in the loop and the inclusive uh, workforce of the future. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I think it sounds so thoughtful and all encompassing. And obviously like none of us really knew what to do about COVID, but it sounds like you guys were extremely intentional in providing for your workers. And I think that's really powerful and something that a lot of us can learn from. Um, in case of the next crisis, hopefully one doesn't come. And I've been asked to invited to come and speak to, at, uh, to many of our clients. They are large tech 
companies, large AV companies, etc. I've been invited to come and speak to their employees about what we have done through COVID and um, just not as, oh, she's this great invited speaker, but just, just like I was speaking to you about what does it mean to be an employer, to be a, um, a vendor to our clients or a partner to our clients and to be an employer on the other side of an inclusive workforce. That makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to go a little bit bigger scope now, just about iMerit. So iMerit is a data enrichment company that provides the necessary elements to make artificial intelligence and machine learning possible. So what do you think the possibilities of data-enabled progress are? So first of all, we are, we are in the business of providing high-quality data. It's very simple. AI data solutions, high quality AI data. I could just say that in those four words, right? What does that mean? So we look at a client problem and we say, how can we provide the training of the machine algorithms through the label ops? In cases there is mapping operations, there could be quality audit, validation, and very importantly, the references of the edge cases. Sometimes clients call us edge casers because we look at large amounts of data and we label them, we train them, we train the algorithms, then we look at how the algorithms are working, then we audit stuff, then we may, if they go into, into, into let's say into cars that go out, we map them, we look at the maps coming back, um, and we look at how they have to be fixed. And all through that, we're looking at what are all the edge cases, because we have to reference and record the edge cases so that the next set of people being trained, you know, they actually can take those edge cases. And you might think that's just one to 2%. No, it's a high number, depending upon what we're working on. Sometimes the edge cases could be, you won't even call them edge cases because they're 50% of the data we see. And we need to be able to address them to get the high quality data. So that is the importance as algorithms data. So as algorithms are going into, into the trend of data, um, a greater focus on the quality of data versus the algorithms than the ML required to solve them because we've been working on the ML and the algorithms for a long time. I mean, that's what, how we came in as a company of training machine algorithms, right? The data labeling company, the data enrichment. But now more and more, and you can reference speakers. I mean, he's probably the best known speaker on this is Andrew Ng and he talks about the trend, the focus on the quality of the data versus the ML required to solve them. And that fits exactly into where we're going, right? So the kind of questions you're asking are, not as what is the best technology that somebody can innovate to be able to do this? Of course, it's important. But what are the best technologies and the best quality of data you can get between the technology and the expert workforce? So AV companies cannot, what are the challenges you said, can't take products to market alone. The path must go through city approvals, policy, governance, things like that, right? So you need no new protocols. You need the city's ability to evaluate. Uh, you need the lack of sharing the data about the user experience, the coordination, all this has to come together for autonomous mobility to happen on a large scale. So it is about the quality of the data. And more and more, as you well know, we're finding that the humans in the loop, and this is where the edge casers come in, that people call us that, and creating of skilled jobs, the real-time mapping. So what we are finding is, and this I think is what is exciting for us, we have had a ringside seat when we look at like an autonomous mobility, we've had a ringside seat of looking at how things have evolved from the machine learning and the algorithms to the best quality data and the importance of that. And the data ecosystem is a massive opportunity. And 
I'm very excited by that because this is creating a lot of skilled jobs. Um, if you want cars or vehicles or autonomous, whatever, to uh, process environments like humans, then you need humans to teach them about the environment. But the judgment is still there in a lot of these edge cases for the human judgment to come in. And so it's about bringing these together. Um, and so that's where I think of this almost as the data as a service. You know, you could, um, so you could build a business around data as a service and um, the high quality data becomes really important. And that's why I think we took a good bet in getting into this business, even and as we approached it with the, um, and I'll use these words now, which as we view, approached it, use building an inclusive workforce with the social impact in mind, as we built that. Now we look back on it and people say, wow, you took a really good bet. That was very clever of you. And I think, look at it, I'll be very honest and say, we actually lucked out as well. And this has become a massive opportunity. And I'm really glad that we had that ringside seat and that we have now emerged as being, as experts in the loop, inclusive workforce with the technologies to be able to offer the best solutions and AI quality data to our clients. So it, you know, it's a combination of investing right, having the right people, investing in the technologies or creating the technologies that provide the solutions, but then having the best clients in the world, you know, to, mm. to, who gave us that ringside seat. And so now it's uh, a massive opportunity and, you know, business is growing crazy. <laughs> uh, we're creating jobs in a massive way and uh, really looking forward to the next phase of this as um, AI starts to get into production, into uh, being used in its applications and in creating this AI digital economy uh, around AI data. So yeah, I'm very excited about it. I, I don't know, I'm coming across maybe too positive, but no. um, this is it in a COVID time, but uh, it is really, it's really exciting. And sure. building that with the inclusive workforce, 50 plus percent women. I'm so happy about that. Mm -hmm. Women in AI, women in the technology economy and data economy, um, getting, having young people from low income, marginalized, um, under-resourced backgrounds, whether they are in US or in India or in Bhutan and expanding now, we have working with a, a set of partners also in Africa. I think this can create a very inclusive economy. For sure, yeah, and just hearing about all the ways that you guys are constantly learning and growing and keeping up with what is happening in the field of artificial intelligence, like this guy's the limit, it sounds like. Um, so yeah, to continue on, just to circle back to this idea of inclusion. So we talked a little bit about it, and so my question for you is, what do you think the power of inclusion is? And moreover, what can inclusion offer to other companies in the artificial intelligence space? So first of all, and now I'll look at it purely from the business point of view, because in business, in order to really have um, the right solutions in the market, our people work with the leading AI companies in the world and see the leading edge technologies, which are always changing. And AI is solving some of the, most, the toughest problems and challenges and edge cases in AI. So why is inclusion important? Think about things like AI and precision agriculture. You're bringing, inclusion brings us knowledge. I mean, there are some of our people, and I kid you not, I listen to how they are thinking about, they're talking with the client about why they're looking at this particular set of images and why they have had the judgment, which is different in the labeling, which is different from what the client 
data scientists have, are thinking about. And I had this one young lady, she says, you know what? I come from the agriculture side because my, my mm. family is a farming family. Yeah. And I bring this view of the, this cotton crop that we're labeling. And let me tell you why this is good and why my approach. And this person came to us with a high school background who is now completed, who's a graduate completed college. And, and, but she is excellent in the way she and her team and the way she's trained them. And I overheard this conversation is a very leading, one of the leading uh, agriculture companies and using AI in agriculture, probably the most leading. And um, this data engineer and data scientist around the call and like, oh my gosh, she's really pushing back on this. And they were like, you know, you're right because you bring that expertise into it. So that's an example of bringing different kinds of backgrounds in inclusion. The same is true when you're looking at speech to text, you better have different diversity of speech in a particular speech to text algorithm. Otherwise you're gonna end up with some examples out there where uh, the CEO is a woman of a large company and their speech to text only recognized 45% of her, what she was saying because it had been modeled on, um, you know, a particular group of men. And mm. that doesn't bring you the inclusion, inclusion from a technology and diversity. So, and the fact that you have a young workforce, our attrition is 7%. Where in, in India, for example, technology companies, IT services companies, it's running above 30%. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they are developing careers with us and they've come from a background that may be under-resourced, marginalized, and they're developing a career and they are sticking with us. And that experience they bring of being with us for five years or whatever is hugely valuable to business, to the company. So mm -hmm. I think that internet has become inclusive, mobile has become inclusive, AI and data better become inclusive. So that's why I think inclusion really works for the business and mm -hmm. it'll create the best algorithms, the best kinds of um, uh, solutions that go out to for different applications, whether it's AI and med, agriculture, uh, e-commerce. Um, we used to have this thing. We have fashionistas from four different backgrounds, fashionistas. They would be from New Orleans. They would be from Metis Bruce. They would have a very different view of the fashion that we were doing on e-commerce. So um, I think that becomes really important. Um, one last thing I would say, um, in this is a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a different thing. We 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 um, have something in the company called mentoring in the line of execution. Um, mm. Let me explain what that is. Um, people say, for example, you know, how do you mentor your people? What do you do? Um, mentoring in the line of execution says people are working. They are doing their jobs, et cetera. You can go in there and say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, improve yourself, learn this, take a course on course, et cetera. But when you mentor in the line of execution, they are developing in as they are executing or as they are delivering, as they are doing their work. This is a big thing that we have in the company that all of our executive leadership team adopts, as well as the, yeah. we call it LT under ELT. And I wanted to mention that as part of building this inclusion because then we bring the knowledge and the value of our clients during working for them to our employee base. It's a little bit hard to explain, but it's called mentoring in the line of execution. And our clients really value that. Well, I'm kind of smiling because you kind of read my mind in terms of my next question for you. It's regarding mentorship. That makes perfect sense though. And I think just in general, my understanding of like diversity and inclusion especially is that like the more perspectives that you bring to a problem, the more robust of answers you'll get. So absolutely. I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely 100% correct. And you can obviously see it in the work that you do. I think it's awesome. So yes, my final question 
is in addition to being a CEO, founder, and change maker in social progress and business, you're also a mentor. What do you believe the power of mentorship to be? <laughs> the power of mentorship. I can tell you, um, let's give you an example from my early career. Um, I tell you as an engineer, I joined HP Labs, Hewlett Packard Labs at a time when, and a lot of young people now know this, but David Packard uh, brought up, uh, brought this uh, management technique in called management by wandering around, MBWA. And that is ingrained in my, it's like in here, it's, it's, it's in every cell of my brain because I benefited hugely from that. And to me, that translated into mentoring because he would do this management by wandering around. He knew, he knew all, all of us. He knew he would have this um, water cooler conversation. Um, and this is the CEO and the founder of Hewlett Packard Company. And as you know, and it, it was... It was just mentoring, that mentorship that I got. And this MBWA became a really important part of my management beliefs and, um, and becoming, um, mentoring is becoming a trusted advisor and then experience guidance, providing pathways to people rather than mentor being somebody who told you what to do. And so that's where this mentoring in the line of execution started. So I really believe in the power of mentorship. I give you a couple of kind of uh, uh, almost funny examples in the company. Um, they call me, a lot of the India team, or most of them call me D. D is kind of short form for um, older sister. Okay. And sort of, they'll call me D, D, and, and sometimes very sassy. They'll say D, I, I, somewhere they heard me explain that the average age of our workforce, well, oh, we're all young, we can do whatever. They'll tell me sometimes, you're being very conservative in uh, what kind of work we can do. You should bring it on, you know, so they'll challenge me. Oh, that, that sounds very hard. So that's why we should be doing it. I was talking about multi-sense of fusion. I'm like, how are we going to train people on this? Oh, yeah, we can do. And they said, um, so they said D. And then somebody says to me, very sassy, says, oh, it would be, uh, yeah, I know it's over 24, but if it were not for you, we would be under 23 as the average age <laughs> of the company. So I'm like, you kidding me, you know? This is what you're, you're saying to me. And so there is this openness. And as a result, that's the fun side of it. But when there is a problem, I will get Google chats from people. They don't think of me and many of the ELT as their, I don't think of me as CEO at all, that Google chat mm -hmm. will bring up something very, a difficult problem that they cannot address, especially young women, Lindsay, mm -hmm. will, send, will send on chat a problem to me or a situation they have. And I say this with all sincerity that you would never think of taking to a CEO. Wow. They never think this is exposing me in a bad light. They'll say, D, what should I do? What do you think? You know, And that to me is the power of mentorship because they have that confidence, that transparency, and the trust. As much as I trust in them, they trust in me as being a mentor and not just a CEO. So I hope that explains it. No, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's something we should all aspire towards as we become leaders, you know, is to just help along those that have brought us here. That kind of leads well into my final question. Just in terms of your career um, at IMER and abroad, like all that you have done, what do you hope your impact will be on those you've helped? I think, first of all, it's a two-way street. Um, I feel like just a catalyst 
Um, mm. And I'm not being humble about this. I'm a catalyst. Uh, I make, bring out what the potential of the people and my helping them. Yeah, helping to bring out the potential. But it's eventually, I truly believe in empowerment. And, you know, some people will do exceedingly well because they have that within them. And, and if they don't, they're willing to take risks, go out there. So much of this was about risk-taking, juggling, wanting to learn, can-do attitudes. So I think that's what I'm hoping, I'm, I'm not hoping, but, but I bring out, or we as I Merit as a company brings out in young people. And uh, what do I think is the future of this? I actually think that all companies, we're not going to be unique. All companies will have to uh, embrace an inclusive workforce or inclusion in their companies. People of different backgrounds, different diversities, and that's what technology will make possible. And I think that's what will build the companies in the future, that companies in the future will have you know, what uh, the social scientists talk about, and in fact, people talk about is triple bottom line. There will be financial always, and the business growth, there will be in the commitment to the environment, and there will be absolutely inclusion, because that creates the best companies. And that's what I think in all this job creation we're doing, we're doing that and having youth and young women participate in this digital economy, I think that's what builds the future. So that's my fervent belief and uh, kind of passionate belief. And I hope it happens. It's happening, I think. Yeah, yeah I think it's happening. I think that, that's a solid bet. Well, thank you so much for answering all of my questions. I am so grateful to have met you and to have spent time with you. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Oh, thank you for having me on and letting me go on about some of the passionate, uh, some of the passion we have at I Merit and what we do, and it's a great opportunity to share this with you, and you've been so thoughtful in your questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, again, this is Radha Basu of iMerit.